Welcome back to the PMC project, the Positive Masculinity Project. This one, seven golden rings, number seven, class seven. This one's still on shame relief. Class seven is on shame relief. Uh, we have on this one, part three on this one, sin and shame. Specifically today, we're going to go into how to unbundle sin and shame. I think uh, this is a tough one, Abednego, for church people, I think, who are trying to separate sin and shame because they are separate components and how do we separate these component parts okay uh because if we really do believe that jesus was here and he died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins well then why don't we let him forgive those sins and let it go and so there's a part of our brain that is held captive by the sin element and then once we understand that and he died on the cross our brain still holds on to the other component on this, the shame side of this thing. And it's just really ruins everybody's life in many more ways than need be. And so I'm going to go into that a little bit. Abednego, again, Ragnar, thanks for being here. I'm going to dive in real quick because uh, we've got a short time on this. And I'll try to uh, keep my speech down so people can keep up with what I'm talking about. You know, one of the things that makes it hard, I think, is that we first see, if you go back to the biblical account, um, we see Adam and Eve, we see in the Garden of Eden on this, and there was no shame, and it says that in there, and there was no shame, at the end of, I think it's uh, end of chapter two, is it, and it says there was no shame, and it has that very sentence in there, and all of a sudden then, when sin enters into the world, shame is introduced, okay, and so as Christians, people of faith, it could be anybody, because it works the same, shame is universal, and it works for everybody, when we feel like we have done wrong or been called out on something, whether it be related to a moral code or not, we instantly, instantly feel shame. Okay. And so what we want to talk about today um, is how that works on this. There's a couple things I have to start digging into um, here in a second. And we're going to have some definitions that I want to go over on this. Um, and while I'm getting this set up on here, Abednego, let me go to you, set the scene on us, um, for us, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, shame, just real quick, couple minutes on why on earth we associate sin with shame so hard. If you can give us a quick, if you can give us a quick rundown on that, buddy. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got to picture it. God creates Eden and you got to believe that it had to be the most beautiful thing you ever saw in your life. Everything is perfect. Um, he creates Adam and from Adam, from his rib, he creates Eve. And I'm going to bet that she was a total knockout. And um, he told Adam, you tend the garden and everything in it. Uh, everything was theirs to partake of, to enjoy, um, there was only one tree in the middle and they had to stay away from that. And he says, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. And, uh, and so they, uh, you know, they live their life. They're doing things. They're running around totally naked. The Bible says they have no shame, no shame at all. Um, totally naked. They sin. God comes down. They hide. They had because I think they took God at, their, at his word that he said that you would die. And so I think they thought he was going to judge them and zap them right there. And um, so they hide. Uh, they did die. They died in a spiritual way in that they were separated from God. They didn't have that close relationship. And there's different ways the Bible talks about death and spiritual death uh, is one. And so... Um, you know, they, they broke the laws, they broke the rules and, and that separated them from God. Um, and, and because of their shame, uh, because of their sin, they tried to cover themselves. They tried to hide themselves. Um, God ends up putting clothes on them and, uh, you know, because of Adam and Eve's sin, we can't run around naked like that anymore. Um, <laughs> without it being a whole ordeal, um, but you know, it's it's a uh, it's it's a deal um, when we're talking about sin and shame, and uh, and how those things um, interrelate, but how they really really don't. Um, because I think sometimes what we 
would take maybe a shit as a, as a feeling of shame is really a feeling of guilt that we have. Um, we feel guilty that we did something that went against um, our moral conscience, or we feel guilty that um, we did something that went against uh, God's rules, God's laws. And so because we feel guilty, we identify that automatically uh, with shame. And we would say that we're a bad person and we, we begin to own that shame. Um, and so uh, that's not what guilt really is for. We feel guilt, so we'll repent. Um, we feel guilt, so we'll repent and that will turn back to God and have a right relationship with him. He doesn't want us to pack around shame over our sin. He wants us to turn to him, say, God, I'm, I'm sorry I messed up. And he wants to forgive us and move on down the road. Not for us to carry this around. Jesus said he came so we could have life to the full, not so that we could carry a full load of shame around. I think that's a hard thing for most people because they they view these. We've used this image before uh, as when you laminate two boards together. And we have mm -hmm. always in the church somewhere, probably goes back to that very time of teaching, is that we view sin and shame are laminated and we can't separate them. And so if we have sin somewhere, um, then somewhere along the way, we can just drag this old terrible, awful bucket around, okay? And um, make sure I spell things correctly up here. Um, I think, let me go here. You put it there and built a great foundation for us on that, Abednego. One of the things that we want to keep in mind on this, sin, and, and by the way, if you guys can think of two more awful things to talk about, let me know. Okay, but sin and raise your hand if anybody wants to go and talk about sin and shame and let's have a conference about sin and shame. This is terrible. Um, it's like that bucket of awful. And I don't mean here, let's I don't mean this deal. Okay. I mean this other deal here. Okay. Um, how what is that? There you go. I'll get it I get it right. You know, all this terrible stuff inside this deer that you've got open and you don't want to eat that. This is like shame feels like this whole bucket of awful. Or you can use that one, too, if you want. Either way, it's no good. And one of the things that hit me really well, I think it resonated, Ragnar, before when you talked about sin and what's that literal meaning. This is an ancient word here. And it cut through a lot of layers because I think in the church of Bendigo, we have all these things associated with sin, okay? And Ragnar... To you, when we talk about sin, you broke it down on a real primal definition. What does that mean in terms of how you broke that down for us? I think you put it the best I could, so go ahead. Yeah, I think it originally came from like in ancient times. It was like an archery. A sin is missing the mark. You're aiming for a mark and you miss the mark. There's no emotion associated with it. There's no judgment. There's no shame. It's just you missed the mark. You were, you know, you were going for a certain outcome and you missed it. So it's time to course correct, increase your awareness, education, and try again. But there's no shame. There's this emotion in there. The emotion's been bolted on as an influencer to control people. But you just missed a mark. That's what seems. But when, I was raised the same way. When you hear the word sin, you get that kind of, ugh. You know, you can just feel the wave of shame coming, judgment coming. You know, he sinned. They missed a mark. That's what they did. They missed a mark. Try again. And it doesn't have to be anything more than that, okay? And there's a couple things here. So we want to make sure we're together on this. Now, in the church, we talk about, you know, Bendigo, you brought this up. We broke some code. We broke our, or not our code, but we broke conscience. We did something. We know better. We stole something, lied about something. We did something, okay? And so we broke conscience there. Sin is different. Uh, than transgression, okay? And I think we've mixed all that up somewhere, too, is a transgression. Trans means to break, to go across, okay? Trans, uh, transgression, we broke a rule. We broke a law here, okay? And associated with all that, it goes beyond guilt, and then we turn this thing into shame for control side of this thing, okay? And again, we step in this big bucket of awful stuff, and it's just terrible everywhere. We just have the shame gravy all over us here. One of the things I'm going to say here that I, somewhere along the way, I didn't hear this early on in life, or I didn't pay attention, or I didn't have the awareness tools somewhere 
to make sense of it all, I couldn't process it probably, okay, is that if we're going to say, Abednego, that Jesus died for us on the cross, right? That's what you're saying, okay? That's what we all, Christian faith, that's what this is about. He died for your sin, to forgive your sins. But yet we can, uh, we keep dragging this old thing around. And what's hard for people to understand is we will say, and mentally we process that, yep, he took our sins to the cross and he did this thing and he died for our sins. Okay, if he did that, what on earth is it then that we keep dragging around here? Okay, if he really did die for your sins, why on earth? Do we keep feeling this terrible thing? I want to tell you guys a little story here. We've got a few minutes left. We had a guy that, uh, guy came into our class. And this particular class, this was his first time meeting in there. I think it was a bed to go. Uh, mm -hmm. You can remember maybe better than I on that. Because sometimes when I get into classroom mode, I don't put all of the dots together exactly right. But I'm sure it's in your notes. Is that... That particular day, it was a full house. I think we had 23, 24, five people, and, and it was, there really wasn't, there really weren't any extra seats in there, okay? And this guy showed up, and he sits, poor guy, he sits right in the middle of the class, and he's trying to be active on all this. And we had been through the shame concept. We'd been through the shame curriculum. We'd been through suicide calls. We'd been, and so he shows up, and at the particular time, we were talking about how to unbundle sin and shame how to break up these component parts. And I said, okay, we can break this down. We can have an analysis on this. And so I started writing on the board, which is where all the magic happens anyway. And I said, look, this analysis will work for any topic. It'll work for, you know, in the, in the church here, everyone gets excited about premarital sex. And, or you can use this for divorce. You can talk about and break up unbundle sin and shame component parts when you talk about divorce or substance abuse. So, and this guy raised his hand and interrupted me. He said, hey, can we, um, why don't we try that? Because this divorce thing's really bothering me and I need some help on this thing. So can you just do an analysis on how you would break up sin and shame on a divorce situation? And I said, that's fine. So we started writing down some stuff and he's, and I said, okay, so if it's okay with you, and again, I'm talking to this brand new guy and 24 or five guys are sitting around the room looking at all this. Because it was really, I think, Abednego, the first time we'd broken this down like this. And so everybody was into this thing, okay? And I said to this new guy, I said, okay, so tell me about this deal. So when did the sin happen? That was one of the things I was trying to find out here is to, to break this down. So here's the analysis. Let me, let me go through here and you can take your notes and do your thing. I'll try to write it down as best I can. Um, when did the sin happen? Okay. And so when did it happen? And he said, it's ongoing. And I said, no, you're sitting here. Unless you're having terrible thoughts, the sin isn't happening. So my question was, when did the sin happen? He said, no, that's, and it, we went back and forth for a while. And I said, just tell me what is going on. He said, well, 10, 11 years ago, my wife took the kids and she ran out to the West Coast and left me there. I said, okay, all right, good. So here we go. So when did the sin happen? I don't know, 11, 12 years ago, okay? So if you're talking to someone and trying to work them through this, the sin isn't happening now. So just bail it, break it down. Okay, so the sin happened before, some time ago, whatever. I said, okay, so she left, so you sinned, she sinned, whatever. How about we agree to this? There were some transgressions. There were people who broke covenant. There's two people in a relationship. Eh, yeah, some wrong happened, whatever, but it was a long time ago, right? He said, yes. Okay. So I said, okay, so some sin happened. Can we agree then? And I asked him that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's all right, ready to sign up for that. And I said, and you're a baptized believer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus died for you. And I think that's a critical question, but people stop there on this analysis. So, you know, not only, Abednego, did Jesus die for your sins, right? Because everyone will say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so he agreed to this. Did Jesus die for your sins? Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the Christian faith, this is 
this is really key, okay? Did Dyfer said, yeah. So he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so what on earth are you still 10 years later dragging this all around for? He said, I just feel bad about it. I feel bad that I sinned or she sinned or whoever. And I said, wait a minute. You just told me in front of all these people that Jesus just died for your sins on the cross. But yet you're not letting him do his job up there on that cross. He's miserable. Why did he have to go through all that torture? If you've seen The Passion or any of these shows, why did he go through all that if you're not going to let him take your sins away? And the guy said, what? I said, no, you still feel terrible. And I said, look, man, if he really died for your sins and you said he did, and you admit that, and you freely give that to him, then it must be something else that you're dragging around here, okay? And he looked stunned at me, and everybody else in the class was not, everybody else could see where this is going. And I said, look, if you're not feeling bad about your sin, because you just said, you know, Jesus died for your sins, all this, what on earth are you feeling bad about? What are you dragging around? Everybody in the class said the same thing. It was almost like, you know, it was choreographed, but it wasn't. Everybody else said at the same time, they said, man, I said, what are you dragging around? And everybody said, shame. You're dragging around this shame. And I could see at the time, this guy exhaled. I have audio of it. The guy had, he exhaled. He put his hand like this. Oh, man. I said, you're dragging around shame for 10, 12 years. But you think it's about sin. The sin's been taken care of. Jesus did his part. You need to do your part, okay? Jesus, you know, I must say this, let Jesus do his part. If he's going to go and die like that on a cross and get tortured, no, let him do his part, okay? And if you're not going to let him do his part, then it's all for naught. It's wasted. Um, now, as humans, you know, we've got a few minutes left. We can do our part, and we're called to do our part, okay? You need, I'm going to put this here, you need to do your part, okay? You need to do your part, and your part is, okay, get rid of shame. Now, go back to part one on the shame hierarchy. On class seven, part one, get rid of the shame. Again, you're in a shame prison. But the key is right outside of here. You can let yourself out of this. Get rid of of your shame and i think this is a really hard thing for everybody we haven't been taught this much at all about sin and shame can be separated they can be separated on this and i think that's a really is one of the key parts about we've talked about it ragnar and i want you to go into this a little bit is that the reasons we're not taught about this and mostly people don't know but if you can just go in for a second on how control works and how shame is used and why people keep pushing this button. If you can, Ragnar, just give us a little bit on why it's not in our best interest to get rid of shame. Well, I think it's, there's a, a an intellectual laziness uh, with most people. I mean, you know, shame, shame starts at, uh, you know, in the kindergarten sandbox, you know, and it's, it's almost like an instinctual survival instinct. I mean, it just comes out quick. Uh, you know, little kids will shame each other over trying to use each other's toy in the sandbox, you know, and I think, but I think on a mass scale, you know, I've touched on it a few times, I think it's, 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 a, it's a way for people that are in power that want to stay in power to, to keep the, the sheep at bay and in their nice rows and in a straight line. And it's just such a, a visceral it, it, it works on little kids. I mean, you, you can see parents, you go into a store and you'll see parents shaming little kids when they're trying to get a candy or something. It's just, it's just a cotton candy way of, of, of getting people to conform. It's not healthy, but it, it's an easy button to get people to conform, to keep societies uh, together. I see it now, you know, they, like I said before, they, they use the church back before technology and mass communication. They would use church to dissipate a lot of this man-made shame, and they would they would put it in between two pieces of church bread and 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 Christian bread, and a little shame in there in the sandwich. And they would they would pass that out to the masses to call the masses, and so they could keep the power structure the way it was. Now that technology is so prevalent, 
Um, and it's much easier with a cell phone and things like that to, to commercials, TV commercials through mass media to control the population with communication and movies and music and everything else. They don't really push anymore. The mass, the masses, the the, uh, the elites that push church for for millennia to to help control. If you notice now, you don't hear the positive stuff about church much in the media anymore. It's usually negative because now the church to dissipate communication for controlling people and shaming people is an inefficient way to do that now. So they do it through technology. Um, so that's why now for the last twenty years, the church is treated like the sheep of the family, pretty much. But it's a, it's a, it's a, for whatever reason, humans just really have a, a soft spot and very little antibodies to defend themselves to shame when it's, when it's perpetrated by someone that knows to do it and that has experience in doing it. And like you said, you can see it in, in kindergarten classes. It's early probably because they got it from the teachers and they've been shamed at home. The kids, they start shaming, shaming each other in the sandbox. So we've had it for decades by the time, by the time we're our age and trying to deconstruct how this happened and trying to get ourselves reprobed out of it. You've got sometimes 30, 40 years of this shame programming, day, multiple times a day, through media, through through teachers, church, parents, siblings, friends. Just it just happens all the time. So it's it's it takes a long time to to have that shame detox happen. But I think it's just it's been an easy control mechanism. It doesn't require a lot of skill, but and so I think it just took off. Abednego, I think. Um what he's talking about here okay and your position in ministry over the last you know 20 years or so has really you know has some insights on this about how people are dragged sometimes we got to drag them in front of the elders tribunal and shame everybody and bring them in front of the congregation you know and all this and um i think it's a really key thing and if you can talk about though how that really short circuits the relationship we're supposed to have with jesus Okay, sure. because we always bring into this relationship shame and you can't be open and honest about it if you're dragging shame into this and just talk about some of that damage that happens all the time. We keep pushing this shame button and Ragnar, by the way, I see you change your camera angle. So I just I got a face here with the dark and it looks it looks awesome. I got I got to tell you that. And I don't, you know, I want to take away from the I content. had some company come in. So I had to get back to a quiet there you go. I, I, I got to say, I like that. Uh, but but you're liking the look, aren't you? A little bit. I, I vote. Listen, man, no shame here. I, I just, I like the look on that. Abednego, yeah. talk to us about it every time we keep hitting that shame button and the damage it does, really. Yeah. Well, we're all going to have to go with that look the next time. That, that'd be just like talking heads is what it looks like. So that's awesome. You may, you may have to ease into that. You may have to ease. You may not be quite there yet. Just dim it down a little bit at a time. And, and so, you know, um, I think Ragnar was, Ragnar was right on with um, shame, and we see shame a lot with, you know, maybe you call it the elder tribunal or whatever. Um, you see that used a lot in church, and really shame is just, it's a really, it's just an easy way uh, to do leadership. I'm, I don't think it's the most effective way, but it's the easiest way, you know, um, you can, you can lead people either through fear or influence. Those are usually the two ways you lead people. So, you know, you've got the coach who yells and screams at everybody and they're going to come in line because of fear, but they're only going to play so hard for that coach. If they love that coach, that coach has come alongside them and, and has taught them and has showed um, that he has compassion for them and he understands them and he's taking time with them, then he has influence. And that kid will do anything for that coach who he loves. He won't do that for the coach he fears, but he do it for the coach he loves. I think sometimes in church, it's easier. And it's easier as a coach to yell, scream, and be a maniac, and you get some kind of result. Um, you, you get that result from controlling people. And I think control has been a big issue all throughout um you take um when jesus comes on the scene jesus comes on the scene and um he starts teaching things that nobody else has ever taught um he starts drawing people he starts feeding uh massive amounts of people he's healing people he's doing all these miracles 
And what these religious leaders see is all their people are going over there to check out Jesus. And they get mad. And so what do they do? They start shaming him. And one of their big tactics was to try to shame him. And so, hey, wait, wait, whoa. We know who you are. You're the carpenter's son. You're that, you're that no name person from Nazareth, right? Yeah, you're you're nobody. Or you know, well, you don't have the schooling we've got. You know, we, we've got the schooling you don't. So who are you to tell us this? And they would shame him all the time to try to control him. And they never could control Jesus. They, they couldn't do anything back. They wanted to control back, but Jesus was taking it away from them because Jesus led with influence. He didn't lead with fear. He led with influence. And people loved that. People wanted to be with him. I mean, you, you wonder, why in the world did all the sinners invite Jesus to the parties? They weren't inviting the Pharisees or the Sadducees or anybody else. But boy, they invited Jesus to all the parties. Why did they invite? Because they knew he wasn't going to shame them. He wasn't going to condemn them. He was going to tell them the truth. He was going to tell them the truth about their sin. Um, he, he was going to give them truth. But he wasn't shaming them. He genuinely loved them, and they understood that. And that's why you see just a massive amount of just like dysfunctional people, very sinful people following Jesus like crazy. And they followed him because he loved them. He had influence with them. He wasn't trying to, to reach out to them through fear. You know, it's such a different thing, Abednego, you talk about because most of us brought up under some kind of authority figure. Okay. And it's the lowest common denominator, this shame thing. Okay. Hey, be quiet down there. Settle down back there. Why can't you act like Susie? And so it's a really hard thing to get away from, but wherever Jesus went, he made people feel better. Now, obviously not made them feel better because they put him on a cross. So there are some people who are just threatened by all this stuff. Okay. And he was impervious to this thing. Shame here. Um, guys, this has been a great series. I just love being with you guys and going over this stuff. Um, as far as the review side of this, we've got to learn to uh, unbundle sin and shame. And, and we can't really do that until we break it down into its component parts. Okay. We've got only a couple minutes uh, left on this. Uh, Ragnar, quick hit on this, buddy. Well, I've been going through the, the classic book, Psycho-Cybernetic, you know, Dr. Maxwell Maltzen. And today I heard you're a mistake maker, but you're also a mistake maker. And you need to take the emotion out of makes. It's just, just, it's just testing. You know, that didn't work. Like in marketing, we talk about testing. Just take the emotion out of it. You miss the mark. Recalibrate, raise your earnest, and try again. You miss the mark. Take, take the shame, take the emotion, take the negativity out of it. Just be logical about it. It's one of the times where I recommend algebra on this one, actually. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't recommend algebra on a date, but recommend algebra with this. Keep it left brain. Just keep it analytical. Yeah. I missed a mark. Gather the data, recalibrate, take a breath, and re-engage. Yeah. So this is, this is where we, we actually want algebra in this type of situation. What do you got for us at Bendigo? You got something there. You know, yeah, this is the thing that's been churning in my mind. There's lots of other scriptures, but the one thing I'd want you to know is that when you look at the Apostle Paul, he would say of himself, there's no one more sinful than me. There's no one more worse off in this world than me. And yet he went on to have maybe, you could argue this, the most impact of any other human being on the face of the planet. He wrote yeah. a large portion of our New Testament. Um, he was a sinful guy. He was responsible for a lot of people's deaths, a lot of Christians' deaths. He was going after the church, trying to kill off the church. And yet somewhere, somehow, he was able to separate sin and shame. Yeah. He knew that Jesus forgave his sin and his shame. And he left the shame behind, and he went on to do incredible things. And I believe that anybody watching this can make that kind of impact for Christ if they'll leave their shame behind. Abednego, that's a really good archetype for us to kind of keep that image, okay? 
um, I think he wrote about two thirds of the New Testament, you know, uh, and he was a warrior, this dude, okay. And he was one of these kind of guys. Um, yes, there was sin, there was, there was wrong there. That's, that's right. But he ran to that grace side of Jesus. He ran to that freedom, okay? And he wanted, he wanted to be liberated from all that. And that's, that's one of the things he did. So guys did a great job again. I didn't mean to ramble on earlier, but unbundle that sin and shame. That's just everybody's constant struggle out here, churches or otherwise. Again, you can contact us, the Crusader 1921. It's Crusader 1921 at Gmail. Let me get 30 seconds in here and just review what we've been through. We've gone through the seven golden rings of relationship success, and this is class seven on shame relief here. We finished up now part three, how to unbundle sin and shame. We've gone through all seven of these. It's a, it's a series that's come straight from the heart from all of us, near and dear, because of the ministry that we do with guys all kinds of guys some church guys some not church guys they're all welcome we love everybody on that and we put a dent in the universe in our own little corner of the world out here and uh, ragnar and abednego you know i'd be remiss if i didn't just you know let you know what a big part of all this is guys and how it's been just a life-changing event to be with you on this i thank you again for the show being here your support uh, love you guys um again crusader1921 at gmail for comments questions um, when you see down below if you would hit that subscribe button like button make comments we'll get back to you uh, for the positive masculinity crusade um, thank you all for joining in and being a part of our part of our crusade on that um, wish everybody the best of luck and get a hold of us if you need anything you guys have a great day until next time we're signing out thank you